Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, from Department of Neurosurgery, today we'll be presenting our CGR, which is journey from potential donor to actual organ donation and organ procurement experience at JPNATC. So we'll be going through uh, introduction and then role of a neurosurgeon, donor management, role of radiology, microbiology, and forensic medicine, and our experience and future future vision. India is lagging behind over many countries with respect to if you take well performing countries like Spain and USA with a world's second population India is trailing back behind in or deceased organ donation due to various reasons if you consider this is organ donation as a marker for healthcare facilities in a country we need to relook into our status and work upon it as a team being in the premier institute of country Indian India's donations have been persistently low and it is uh, around seven, 700 per year for the last three to four years. We have an act in place from the government and we have a directive from our director saying that it is mandatory to declare brain death and give a mandatory request for organ donation and it has to be complained by all treatment, treating physician and we know this is not true at every center in our hospital. We can't end without speaking about COVID in this COVID era. COVID had an impact on donation rates, but when you are committed, like USA and Spain, the per million donations are almost, they could maintain it. India with a very poor rate, we are almost the same. This is a story at uh, trauma center. Being the Apex Trauma Center, we do receive a good amount of severe head injuries and so is the high number of potential donors we find every year. Over the years, there has been change in the direction how they go from the possible donor is a person who is M1, potential donor once you screen of all the contraindications and then once you certify they are called eligible and actual donations once the organ is harvested, we call it as actual donation. We see the last four months we have been working upon this uh, with a different intent, which is the primary goal of this CGR. We can see that there is a significant increase in the donation rates, which is trailing about 30%. Now it is about 60% and the number of donations are about 11 in a period of four months. The challenges we had was Resident training, knowledge about brain death certification, issues with screening, logistics from admission, certification challenges, counseling and consent, and medical legal aspects. We had started our annual neurotrauma conference. Uh, we have done it in the March of this year, where we had a brain death simulation program where our, primarily our participants were our residents. It, it was a very good opportunity to train and re emphasize about the nitty gritties of brain death certification. We have started using WhatsApp for uh, donation uh, for screening of the patients where we get a regular updates and we can pick this patient before they have a cardiac arrest and certify them. We had different challenges while we are certification. We have a senior faculty always available to solve any such challenge or controversy and get through the process to certification. As a team, what uh, the CGR also says the same. We have a very good effective team at JPNATC, which is enabling us to do this thing. I now upon call upon Dr. Raj to tell us about the role of neurosurgeon in donation. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll be speaking what is what exactly is the role of a neurosurgeon during all of this procedure. So, uh, first we'll have to ask the question, why the involvement of neurosurgeons is needed? Firstly, and simply to, uh, firstly, uh, simply put, because we receive the maximum number of the patient, and secondly, uh, it is required by law. So, uh, RT and CVA combined, we uh, nearly, uh, th there is uh, around 2 lakhs death per year, and uh, one, in, uh, one death from uh, traumatic brain injury happens every 3 minutes, and one accident per minute is seen in RTA. Similarly, for CVA, around 50,000 deaths per year are seen and 25% uh, death rate can be seen. So, uh, 
what is the continuum of the donor this is a continuum of the spectrum at uh, around which uh, the staging is the staging of the donor is done there is a possible uh, the eligible donor uh, is the person who has been declared brain dead based on the neurological criteria as defined by the indian law and actual donor is the consented donor who has cons who is brain dead and who has consented for the don donation so how do we go around that uh, firstly in a, in neuro uh, in a neurosurgery uh, trauma center uh, we do 12 hourly icu round by a nurse transplant coordinator as well as the 12 hourly updates from neurosurgical residents the information to nurse transplant coordinator is passed on by, by tnc as well as the ward sisters about the m1 patient and uh, the admission of such patients are facilitated here we can see in the uh, uh, whatsapp screenshot that 12 hourly regular updates are being done taken by the faculty as well as the uh, transplant nurse coordinators and uh, all the other team members so how do we go from intracranial hypertension to uh, brain death uh, the sequel sequel of the brain death passes gradually from the cortex to the medullary level so there is the plastic tone which is unresponsive to the deep pain, painful stimuli as well as absence of light reflex and corneal reflex after that the involvement of thalamus and hypothalamus uh, hypothalamus sets in the polyuria and hypothermia is seen followed by the classic uh, classic pushing response as well as the refractory hypertension uh, it is it is so classical that it is very uncommon to see a patient who is branded who is not on any vascular support uh, so here is the same thing which i just described uh, the brain followed by pons medullary and medullary, uh, pons medullary ischemia uh, in the progressive stages so this is form number 10 who must certify for the brain death criteria so first and foremost is uh, any neurologist or any neurosurgeon uh, secondly the treating physician uh, that is in uh, this case uh, neurosurgeon only because we are the admitting uh, in charges then there is authorized specialist who is uh, usually anesthetist or neuro neurointensivist uh, neurointensivist and med, uh, someone from the hospital administration department so uh, there are some of essential prerequisites uh, for the brain death certification first and foremost as for the any illness we should have an idea what is happening to the patient there should be a clear cut uh, established etiology which should be correlated radiologically also and there should be no confounding factors like alteration in thermal cardiovascular metabolic system or any other things which can affect neurological examination so uh, to summarize it there should be a comma of course patient should be even btm1 with a known cause there should be absence of brainstem reflexes and the prime importance is apnea test should be positive apnea uh, here i want to emphasize that uh, the diagnosis of brain death is solely and mostly done on these case these scenarios only as the diagnosis of brain death is a clinical subject uh, clinical uh, diagnosis so the here we can see on radiology white cerebellum sign and uh, diffuse effacement of uh, all all of the brain structures white cerebellar sign uh, there are reversible causes of coma which needs to be excluded before some labeling someone as a brain dead so there should there should be no uh, no cns depression drugs or intoxication or any neuromuscular blocking agents there should not be any primary hypothermia or hypovolemic shock or metabolic or endocrinal uh, disorders so there are uh, tests to uh, confirm the brainstem functions so there is coma spontaneous breathing pupillary size and uh, light reflex dull side movements gag reflex cough reflex apnea test should always be done last because uh, in uh, patients who are not uh, brain dead not suspected to be brain dead th this that should not be done because that is damaged so here are the uh, pictorial representations of the various uh, tests here we can see in the top picture uh, the pupillary size and symmetry is being seen uh, the doll's eye movement are seen the caloric response to the water is seen and as well as the uh, gag reflex and cough uh, cough reflex so how to perform the apnea test so first and foremost uh, prerequisite is there that the patient should be normotensive, normothermic, uolemic, and eucapnic. All the vitals should be stable with normal range of PSCO2, and uh, there should be no prior evidence of CO2 retention. And of course, continuous monitoring uh, is imperative. That goes without saying. 
so the patient should be pre oxygenated for 100% uh, oxygen uh, for 2 minutes and uh, baseline abg is uh, uh, taken uh, with 10 breaths per minute and uh, then the ventilator is disconnected arterial uh, tracheal suction catheter is in, uh, instilled at the level of carina with 10 liters of oxygen and alternatively cpap can uh, cpap can also be attached with 10 cm of water closely very closely respiratory efforts should be noticed uh, and uh, if the psco2 is more than 60 or uh, 20 20 millimeter of rise from the baseline is there and the ph is low and the there should there should be absence of breathing movements if it is there then apnea test is considered negative otherwise it is positive so the test should be interrupted in uh, in the cases of uh, any vital sign disturbances like hypotension significant desaturation or cardiac arrhythmias uh, then there are some considerations uh, normally the apnea test should be carried out twice uh, six years apart uh, for all the adults and uh, for infant and above it should be uh, 12 hours in children and uh, 24 hours per unit in less than 37 weeks it's not done so this is form 10 signed by uh, four different uh, treating physicians and uh, ancillary test i would like to say again that brain death is a clinical diagnosis however in special circumstances when it cannot be done the absence of uh, cerebral blood flow can be demonstrated by various clinical tests which includes uh, spec CT, transcranial Doppler or DSA uh, and CT angiography. DSA is a gold standard but uh, it is uh, logistically demanding procedure and uh, especially in an unstable patient. So CT angiography is a quick uh, thing which can be uh, done at bedside. Uh, so next I will call uh, Dr. Palak from radiology to enlighten us on radiology. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be covering the role of imaging in major trauma and brain death. As a patient comes to the ED with polytrauma, a few of the radiological investigations we do, do as a part of the primary survey are the chest X-ray and the pelvic X-ray to look for hemoneumothorax and uh, rib fractures as well as pelvic fracture. Then we go for a fast and EFAS scan, uh, including the pneumo scan to look for the blood uh, pooling in the bilateral neural spaces, peritoneal cavities and the pericardium. And if the patient is a hemodynamically stable, then we go for a CT for the patient. The CT protocol in a hemodynamically stable patient would include an on-contrast scan of the head and uh, cervical spine and a contrast enhanced scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis with 3D reconstructions of the cervical, thoracic and the lumbar spine. So I will be presenting a case scenario of a 21-year-old male who was an operated case of cyanotic congenital heart disease. His oxygen saturation on room air was low and was on antiplatelets with deranged INR. However, the patient was kept under observation for the next six hours to optimize for uh, further surgical intervention. However, the patient had neurological worsening from M6 to M1 status with no brainstem reflexes. As the status was post-intubation, the SpO2 remained low, hence apnea test would not be performed. Hence, the patient was sent to our radiology department for performing the ancillary test to declare brain death. So, on reviewing the previous CTs of the page, CT head of the patient, as we can see on the 22nd of August, they, we can see an SDH along the left frontal lobe, and there is no midline shift seen on the initial baseline scan. However, within six hours of the initial scan, we can see there is increase in the SDH as well as there is subfalcine herniation and SAH. And on the further on scans, we can see that there is diffuse cerebral hypodensity, which makes the cerebellum appear hyperdense as compared to it, giving the white cerebellar signs suggestive of anoxia. On the sections further down, we can see uh, the on basal cisterns are uh, normal uh, and maintained. However, on the follow, there was uncal herniation with SH and uh, dilatation of the contralateral temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And similarly, on the follow-up, we can see there is increase in SDH and the uncle herniation and midline shift. These are the bony reformatted images showing no bony calvarial injury. And these are the cervical spine, sagittal, axial, and coronal images with no serv significant cervical injury as well as no dorsal lumbar spinal injury. As a part of our secondary survey and to see for any uh, organ, uh, viable organ for further donation planning. 
we do a CCT chest and abdomen, which showed an incidental finding of a right-sided aortic arch, which is associated with TOC. And uh, there is no hemothorax. The liver appears normal. There is a small laceration seen in the splenic parenchyma. And bilateral kidneys appear normal. And bowel loop, vascular structures appear normal. And there is no hemoperitoneum. Similarly, on the lung window imaging, we can see there is no pneumothorax and there is no lung contusion or laceration. So, uh, although brain death is a complete, uh, requires complete accurate clinical evaluation, in some cases, ancillary imaging tests also come into play and these include DSA and CT angiography. However, DSA being more invasive, requiring expertise and less availability, CT angiography is routinely performed all over the country to predetermine brain death. And for this, a seven-point CT angio score has been devised to reduce the policies of CT, uh, CT angiography. A specific protocol has been designed, which includes a non-contrast scan to evaluate the baseline vascular opacification, the early post-contrast scanning, which is acquired at 20 seconds after contrast injection, and it ensures the opacification of the ECA terminal branches, the superficial temporal artery and the facial artery, therefore indicating correct contrast administration. And then we have the late post-contrast scanning, which is acquired at 60 seconds of contrast injection. And its main aim is to rule out any possible delayed vascular opacification due to intracranial hypertension, thus reducing our false positive rates. These are the uh, MIP images, uh, maximum intensity, minimum intensity projection images showing the opacification of the uh, superficial temporal vessels on both sides, indicating adequate contrast injection. And similarly, on the BRT images, we can see there is adequate uh, visualization of the superficial temporal vessels. So, Dupas et al. developed a 7-point CT angio score based on the lack of opacification of the seven cerebral vessels and with a score of only seven exactly indicating brain death. Each vessel has been awarded a score of one. In this, we assess the bilateral pericolosal arteries. And these are the sagittal reformats showing the bi bilateral pericolosal arteries, which are the terminal branches of the ACA and are seen curving around the corpus callosum. Similarly, on the BRT images, we can see the bilateral pericolosal vessels. And then we have the cortical branches of bilateral MCA as seen on these coronal images. These are the cortical branches and similarly on the axial images. And uh, the other two vessels which are assessed are the bilateral internal cerebral veins and the great cerebral vein. This is the sagittal reformat showing the bilateral internal cerebral vein which are combining to form the great cerebral vein. So as opposed, in our case, there was no opacification of the intracranial vessels as can be seen on the axial, sagittal and coronal reformats. On the MIP images, we can see that there is abrupt cutoff of the internal carotid artery in the cervical portion just after its origin and there is no intracranial vascular opacification. However, the superficial temporal vessels are adequately opacified, thus ensuring an adequate scan. And similarly, on the BRT images, the abrupt cutoff of uh, the ICA is seen clearly and no intracranial vessels seen. This is the DSA image for another patient. Uh, in this, we can see that there is this is the ECA with its branches. However, there is an abrupt cutoff of the ICA in its cervical segment, giving the carotid siphon arrest sign. And similarly, the vertebral artery also giving an abrupt cutoff at the um, intracalvarial part. Thank you. Now, I would like to call Dr. Pavna for discussing donor management. Thank you, Dr. Palak. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Pavna. I'm SR from the Department of Neurosurgery. I'll be speaking about donor management in case of brain dead patients. Um, coming to uh, goals in case of uh, donor management, there is transition in goals. Basically, in a case of neurosurgically critically ill patients, our goal is to our, our main goal is neuroprotection. But after brain dead certification of a patient, maintaining circulation and oxygen delivery to the vital organs and preserving their functions in order to maximize the number and quality of transplantable organs is the main goal. So how do we do it? In ATAR Institute, uh, these are the donor management goals uh, which, have, which we have set up. The mean arterial pressure should be around 60 to 110 millimeters of mercury. Central venous pressure should be uh, 8 to 12. Ejection fraction above 45 to 50%. A pH of about 7.3 to 7.5. 
ratio of PAs, PaO2 to arterial oxygen to FiO2 should be more than 300. Serum sodium level should be less than 155. Uh, urine output of more than 0.5 ml per hour per kg over 4 hours should be maintained. And glucose, uh, blood glucose level of 70 to 180 uh, milligram percent is the target. Coming to pediatric donor management, it is almost the same as adult management goals. This is the table given by US Organ Procurement Organization, which shows pediatric donor management goals. In this, it is almost all other goals are almost same as adults, except for the blood pressure, uh, which is uh, the target blood pressure would be normal for the particular age. Coming to how we go about uh, patient, a branded patient at our uh, ICUs. So we, in, we first insert the arterial uh, lines and the central venous cannulae in order to detect rapid fluctuation in hemodynamics, CVP monitoring and uh, to, tape, uh, to uh, taper the inotropes or the tighter the inotrope, uh, inotropic support. Uh, we maintain normothermia of the uh, patient uh, by active warming whenever required. We need to uh, always review and stop all unnecessary medications, especially decongestants and diuretics. And uh, you know we, we do check uh, serum electrolytes and blood, blood, sugar, blood sugar levels every four times. We, we have incorporated VIP approach, which is ventilation, infusion, and pumping approach in order to manage these patients. Uh, we assess the fluid status and correct hypovolemia using fluid boluses and ion groups. We need to start vasopressin infusion as early as possible and also detect and treat diabetes insipidus at the earliest. Uh, lung recruitment maneuvers and chest physiotherapy needs to be done regularly. We need to administer methylprednisolone to all donors at, uh, at the dose of 15 mg per kg body weight. Uh, you, you may repeat the dose up on day two if needed. Alternatively, hydrocortisone injection, 200 mg on day one and 100 mg on day two if needed in other patients can be given. It is important to note that we have to take the blood sample for HLA uh, cross matching before administering uh, steroids. Coming to challenges in donor management, most commonly what we come across at our ICU setups is hypothermia in almost all brain patients. So, in case of, uh, I would like to say that in case of induced therapeutic hypothermia, in which we uh, give it as a therapy, therapy for uh, severe traumatic brain injury patients, we need to wait for 24 hours once the temperature becomes normal. But in otherwise suspected brain dead patients, uh, we need not wait for 24 hours. We just have to wait for the temperature to reach a minimum of 35 degrees Celsius before doing going about uh, brain dead certification. Coming to our next challenge, in case of compound head injuries, or as we can see in the CT image, where the brain matter is uh, herniating through the calvarial defect, can we go about brain death certification and organ procurement? Yes, we can definitely go about brain death certification and organ procurement. Uh, this is not a contraindication. Compound head injury is never a contraindication for organ donation. Coming to our next most common challenge, that is infection, suspected infection. Uh, most of the patients getting admitted with severe traumatic brain injury to our ICUs will have raised procalcitonin levels at an early phase which is no known entity in most of the trauma patients due to acute inflammation. But blood culture positivity is a relative contraindication for organ donation. In organ if the organisms are sensitive to antibiotics, 48 hours course of antibiotics needs to be given and then patient could be considered for organ donation. So now the question arises, if the patient is having high procalcitonin, raised total leukocyte count and fever in a patient with early uh, in an early phase of severe traumatic brain injury, is this called sepsis? Can we define it as sepsis or not? So this question would be answered by my colleague uh, from microbiology, uh, Dr. Smriti. I would like to call her. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavana. I'm going to cover the microbiological aspects of organ donation. The role of microbiologist is to screen the donor for potential pathogens that can harm the recipient as well as solve the query of sepsis and provide antimicrobial susceptibilities if a pathogen is detected. So organ retrieval is a time constraint exercise and the microbiology laboratory at the JPNETC helps this with automation as well as 24 seven pattern. So coming to uh, the viral pathogens first, HIV, HBV and HCV. These are detected by alpha based platform VIDAS. This is the VIDAS instrument. It detects uh, with the sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 99 to 100% and a turnout uh, turnaround time of one hour. 
and the results are immediately communicated to the treating team with the help of WhatsApp. So next, the screening of success. For this, we have uh, some criteria, for example, the SIRS, which includes some parameters like temperature, heart rate, leukocytosis, and respiratory rate. However, there are limitations because these criteria make no sense in brain dead trauma patients. So we have to go for blood culture because this is confirmatory for sepsis and we have automated continuous monitoring systems available which gives a positive signal within uh, as less as six hours, especially in case of severe gram negative sepsis. So this is the workflow. Uh, we receive uh, blood culture samples in the uh, in the bottles which are uh, uh, which is uh, present in the left side of the slide sorry in the life, uh, right side of the slide it is incubated in the back the alert instrument after it gives a positive signal and there is growth in culture it is uh, subjected to uh, multi -talk for identification and vital tool for sensitivity here is an alternative workflow also if the positive blood culture water they can be incorporated into the biofire blood panel which is the rapid molecular uh, assay uh, it can give identification of the organism as well as the provisional sensitivity uh, in the form of drug resistance genes within a turnaround time of one hour. So this is the uh, workflow in detail. So once we get the growth in culture, it is identified with the help of Malditoff, the instrument which is shown in the right side of the slide. Sensitivities are uh, procured with the help of Vitec2. So this is the Vitec2 instrument. So, uh, the results can be available in as short as uh, eight hours. This is an example of the uh, results that we get from Vitec. Here we can see the organism that is identified. Uh, the MIC values as well as the interpretations. So next is the alternate workflow, uh, the BioFire BCID and pneumonia panel. So these are performed on positive blood culture bottles and uh, respiratory samples such as sputum and tracheal aspirate. So it is based on a nested multiplex PCR, uh, one first stage PCR and the second stage PCR. Finally, we get the identification of the organism as well as some drug resistance genes if they are present. So this is the BioFire instrument. This is one of the results. So it shows the gram-positive pathogen. Uh, Staph aureus is detected since this is the pneumonia panel. We have a semi-quantitative detection. The quantity uh, gene copies of uh, the organism is uh, shown in the result. Uh, in this result, uh, there is a viral pathogen detected also in the bottom of the result. We have influenza A detected. So here, no drug resistance genes are detected. So we have another uh, result. Here we have a gram-negative pathogen, acinetobacter bomini detected. Uh, this is also the pneumonia panel. Here we have detected the antimicrobial resistance genes, the AMR genes. So here we have CTHF and uh, NDM. So this has therapeutic implications because uh, we have detected in ESVM and one carbapenemase. So this rules out the uh, uh, rules out the use of uh, carbapenems and uh, the cephalosporins. So in this case, we have to treat the patient with the help of astronam, which is active against NDM, and also we have to add some beta lactamase inhibitor, for example. The combination of ciprazidine and evacuum. So next is screening for sepsis. The other marker is procalcitonin, which we perform with the help of VITAS, once again an alpha-based platform. Uh, it detects procalcitonin in the range of 0.05 to 200 nanograms per ml. So procalcitonin is elevated in case of bacterial infections, but there are uh, certain other causes of elevation, for example, trauma and surgery. In, uh, they elevate procalcitonin independent of infection. So these are the limitations for procalcitonin. So we have to interpret the value of procalcitonin in the context of uh, the uh, clinical conditions. For most of the trauma patients, we have the procalcitonin values in the range of uh, 0.5 to 2 nanograms per ml. But uh, this is not it. Uh, we have uh, some patients whose procalcitonin values were as high as 40 nanograms per ml and even more. So this is not just in our uh, uh, trauma patient. This has been doc documented elsewhere also. Uh, high procalcitonin values even as high as 40 to 60 nanograms per ml have been seen within 24 hours of injury uh, in some patients and that value depends on the extent of injury. So this is the laboratory workup of the 11 actual donors. Uh, so on the x-axis we have the patients from 1 to 11, the donors. Uh, on the right side we have the procalcitonin values in nanograms per ml. Uh, on the left side we have the TLC values. So the bars represent the uh, leukocyte counts. Uh, the gray lines, they represent the procalcitonin values. So in this, uh, uh, I should uh, point out that none of these patients had positive blood or urine culture. There was no growth in these culture, um, uh, but for two patients, case number four and case number seven, they had positive bowel cultures. So uh, these two patients, uh, lungs were not retrieved, uh, retrieved from these two patients. 
Now the procalcitonin values we can see they are high in two patients, case number two and case number seven. So one of these patients they do have a positive culture that is positive bile culture. The other patient doesn't have any positive culture. So we can see that procalcitonin values as well as the leukocyte counts they do not correlate well with the culture findings, especially the sepsis that is blood culture findings. They do not correlate well with procalcitonin as well as total leukocyte counts. Uh, next is the empirical antimicrobial therapy in the potential donors. So the ideal antibiotic should cover for predominant ICU pathogens as per the antibiogram, as well as uh, the current uh, updates in the in our institution. So uh, it has been noted that uh, extended uh, spectrum beta lactamases (ESVLs) they are highly prevalent in our institutes, uh, in our institute, and this has also been noted by the recent uh, ICMR updates. So uh, carbapenems are the current recommendation. And currently, we are giving meropenem plus levofloxacin. This is going to be updated to uh, meropenem plus minocycline because very high levofloxacin resistance has been detect, detected in our recent antibiograms and in the ICMR findings also. So the key message is that TLC and procalcitonin, they are not alone specific markers for sepsis and blood culture has to be performed. This is the current gold standard. And these uh, uh, investigations, viral markers and blood culture, they should be done by rapid methods. And uh, antibiotics should be devised from time to time as per our institute guidelines. And there are future prospects uh, which include multiplex PCR for negative blood culture that will help increase the sensitivity. So on the right side, we have our microbiology team and the JPNATC under the leadership of Dr. Puba Mathurna. Thank you. Now I'll invite uh, Dr. Jhansi for the forensic, medic uh, forensic medicine part. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumiti, and I will be discussing the medical legal issues related to organ donation in the end. So the potential donors at uh, JPNATC are the victims of road traffic accidents, fall from height, assault, gunshot, injury, and hanging cases. Apart from that, we can also have the cases which are out, uh, outstation MLCs. However, we have the police outpost which is located at JPNATC, and the cases have been dealt by this respective police. And we are not dealing with the foreign nationals uh, due to the problems of the uh, ministry and then unknown and unedited cases where the time, time bound for us is uh, 48 hours where we will wait for the attendants uh, to identify. So this is the uh, form 10 which shows the brain stem death uh, certification. Then once you get the certification, the consent has to be obtained in case of minors or unmarried. The consent of both the parents has to be obtained and in case of married uh, donors, the consent of the spouse is very must. And persons who have pledged their organs already, as uh, it was showed in the incident, that is the donor card of mine, although I give consent, suppose if something else happens to me at a point at a later end, the consent of near relative has to be obtained. And suppose if the near relative is not at all uh, available at the time of donation, we can also try for the e-consent or teleconsultation, which has been performed in a recent case where a 45-year-old male who was certified brain dead, his sons were present at the time of treatment and uh, uh, in the hospital. However, his wife has been in Bihar and we have obtained this e-consent through tele uh, on video conference. And in MLC cases, once you get the brainstem certification and consent, we need to obtain NOC from police and also from the and clearance from the forensic expert. And once that clearance has been obtained, we can proceed to the uh, operation theater for organ retrieval. And at JPNATC, once we identify the potential donor, all these cases have been informed to the forensic expert. And these are the timelines from organ retrieval in OT till the handover of the body. So the issues what we see at this time. So the approximate timeline uh, which is taking place in OT for wound closure, cleaning and packing, shifting to mortuary, there we can uh, save at least two to three hours. Suppose if the autopsy is done in OT, however, it is not being practiced in JP NETC. Further reasons like risk of spillage uh, during the head closure, uh, cranial cavity opening and also uh, we facilitate the timing of autopsy in JPNATC not only during daytime but also during the night and 
uh, we can facilitate the autopsy only once we uh, uh, receive the documentation both from the treating team as well as the police at the same time and uh, post mortem examination will be done within uh, 45 to 50 minutes however if we do it in ot that may be minimized to 30 minutes and uh, the limitations uh, in delay or handing over of the body uh, is due to the police inquest which is required prior to the autopsy so at delhi uh, what is happening uh, in jpnatc the hospital outpost mainly conducts the inquest whereas it is not happening in the rest of the uh, states and uh, we will uh, obtain the NOC both from IVO uh, at the outpost and uh, yeah. so I would we would like to recommend that the donor family has to receive a letter of appreciation or a certificate of thanking uh, for organ donation either at the time or uh, at a later point of time and also we should uh, appreciate the contributors who are involved in this uh, noble acts such as the uh, supporting police, transplant team coordinators and supportive staff for the encouragement and motivation. So I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Kannan who is a nurse transplant coordinator to give a detailed note on their uh, work. Thank you Dr. Jansi. And, uh, we are four nurse transplant coordinators working in trauma center as the organ procurement team and uh, our primary role includes doing physical rounds uh, in areas like red area of the emergency department and ICUs and wards for identification and screening of uh, potential organ donors and from uh, the uh, treating uh, residents and also from TNCs and the nurses who are working in that department we will get a message relating to potential organ donors and uh, we uh, in, um, inform these in the organ procurement team faculties and after admitting the patient uh, to the ICUs we assist the ICU nurse and the residents in duty to optimization of the donor and we coordinate workup uh, sending of donor workups and facilitating donors uh, sorry residents and faculty in brain death certification uh, after brain death certification we convert the potential donor alert message to ORBO and coordinate with them in regarding uh, the donor man donor management and retrieval team. And uh, in the uh, initial setup, when we assess for uh, uh, potential organ donors, when screen and identify the potential organ donor, we maintain a uh, good relation or rapport with the family, and we will assess and obtain a basic uh, medical, social, and family history of the donor for future purpose. And in the workup that uh, we have, we are sending in the ICU setup. These are the workups. And in the post COVID, we are sending uh, post COVID uh, time. We are sending uh, CBNAT and RTPCR for patients in order to uh, timely assess the COVID status of the patient so that our resources can be saved. And bad sample is most preferred. And these are the uh, investigations that we are sending. And uh, the contact with the family is the most important because the family's decision is at most in giving consent and uh, their emotional support and uh, their queries. They will be uh, having so much queries regarding how, uh, when will we get the body after postmortem. So these things are met and uh, we play an important role uh, in informing the family about these things. And these are some of the pictures uh, assisting the resident uh, in doing apnea tests and counseling uh, the families and maintaining uh, adequate uh, codes and reports for research purpose and academic purposes. And in OT, we are maintaining uh, everything from the incision uh, time to the organ out time and when the body is being packed and it is sent to post-mortem. And we are monitoring each and every step uh, from admission to the body handover to the relatives uh, so that no problems have been uh, occurred in between. Thank you. Uh, next, I will like to call upon Dr. Panis. So to share our experience, so last four months, we had about 71 possible donors. After primary screening, we had 44 potential donors. 
and we could certify 19, 19 of them as brain dead and 11 donations could happen. The conversion rate from after brain dead declaration was essentially, I would emphasize um, recently, uh, Dr. Deepak himself tries to concern if they are not able to uh, convince if the um, counselors are not able to concern because the neurosurgeon being a treating uh, physician, he would be having maximum confidence, you can gain the maximum confidence of the patients. But um, seeing the scenario, you can understand that we have missed many of these patients who can be converted into donors. For this, we are thinking we are already in process of starting donation after cardiac death. If this come in, comes into place, then we could able to convert the severely unstable patients, those patients who become unstable after first apnea, those who are uh, at very unstable can be converted into donors if they, if we get a concern. So uh, these were the 11 utilized donors and we had about 36 organs harvested by our retrieval teams and 22 tissues. Kidney was being uh, persistently uh, utilized in all these patients and li including liver except for those two patients where there are uh, the patients with CLD or some raised en enzymes. Heart is also uh, utilized if, they, if there is some organic pathology due to heart, the valves have been ex uh, extracted. Uh, we are falling behind with respect to lung. We had only one transplant, but this is the one harvest. But this was the first heart harvest in, of lung of a patient who was diagnosed brain dead at our institute. Cornea being uh, uh, retrieved from most of the patients, but few patients had specific reasons for refusal. Uh, once they have accepted for organ donation, we would not further push them for it all depends upon the patient's concern. So still, we have not yet had any uh, pancreas or bowel uh, harvest or liver uh, lung harvest uh, on a lower side. We couldn't uh, manage any bone harvest. Uh, all this depends upon uh, the counseling and the part after when the family is in such a sorrow to convince for each and every organ would be or tissue would be a difficult task. If we have a specialized dedicated counselors might be these things might get resolved over time. The refusals were usually the fear of banishment from the village or if there is lot lack of trust in the medical system, religious issues. After multiple counselings, few won't be able to understand or receive the concept of brain death. So these were our seven refusals. But after refusals, once you have diagnosed brain death, cardiac death is not an immediate event because we can't take off the support. So a patient might, a kid lasted for around four days after being diagnosed brain dead and we couldn't convert because we had no concern on an average. They would spend about two and a half days in ICU utilizing the resources. The change is, I would say, it is an added burden to all uh, the department. Uh, we would be bothering Dr. Deepak, Dr. Chavi every time for all the problems. If the patients have not been consenting, we have issues with apnea tests. They are always available for us 24-7. Our radiology department, microbiology department, without them, we couldn't be able to do this task. So the teamwork at JPNATC, as you see, is exemplary and can be adapted in other institutes. We could manage the first pediatric donation at AIMS in the last four months. Uh, and we had the youngest donor of 18 months. He is the youngest in NCR, Delhi NCR. The first lung harvest from a deceased donor at our hospital. Uh, uh, Professor Sanjay Lalwani is always asked, we would, without him, there is no go for us to certification. If we are dealing with MLC patients, a non-MLC patient would be a, really a cakewalk, but otherwise if MLC patients, there are many things to be bothered about after the organ retrieval. So, sir is informed always in the first, without his go, we won't further proceed with the case. Counseling, the change was, Dr. Deepak usually tries to counsel all those patients who are not counseled by, or not manageable by the counselors, but this, this is a huge task and it takes multiple counseling sessions which would last for about one to two days sometimes before we get the actual consent. Recently, we conducted a survey depending upon the awareness. The results will be out soon. So I uh, uh, 
call upon Professor Deepak and Professor Chavi for the future vision and dream. So I think uh, we are more or less stable uh, when it comes to number of uh, donations happening from our trauma center. On an average, we are having around two donations, uh, two to three donations each month. And uh, now we need to see, uh, you know, what next. Uh, I mean, we have tied up with most of the departments in the institute. We'll be more than happy if all the organs which we retrieve, they are consumed by our uh, hospital itself rather than being sent outside. This is something that needs to be really worked upon. Me and Chavi, we have been thinking uh, for starting some basic and advanced courses uh, on uh, certification courses. Actually, unfortunately, we don't have any certification courses uh, for the people who are doing routine brain death certifications. Um, I mean, though it looks very good on the paper, how to do an apnea test, but when, when you actually do it, it's like something like doing an operation. You know, what you read in the books is completely different from what you do. So there are so many ifs and buts of apnea tests which we have actually troubleshooted. I'll give you a very simple example which uh, Chavi will agree. The ventilator auto cycling is an entity which not many people know about it. Most of the times the set rate on the ventilator is different from the set rate on the monitor. And the people end up saying this person is having a spontaneous respiration. And actually the patient is brain dead, he's having a severe injury, brain is completely black. All parameters are there in favor of a brain death. But then these patients were being ruled out early and they were being dragged on for a couple of days and subsequently uh, we were losing those patients. So by just simple troubleshooting on the ventilators, we have been able to negate that. And uh, Sanjeev Lalwani is there, I had a discussion with him many a times uh, whether we can actually avoid uh, something a second autopsy I would say. Because patient is being opened up in the operation theatre for the organ harvest and again after closure the patient goes to the uh, auto for the second autopsy. So, um, probably a vitropsy could be one substitute, at least vitropsy for the brain and uh, the abdomen and the chest can always be examined by the forensic experts. So, that probably needs to be worked out. And uh, I think something like blood donation camps, which is happening 17th of September, we have a mega donation camp happening in the, in the country. We should have something like an organ donation pledge by all the faculty of AIMS and uh, this message probably needs to go. And uh, my dream, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, apart from brain test certification, uh, which we are doing and other organ maintenance, is to have the maximal utilization of organs uh, by AIMS, pediatric transplants to pick up in the institutes and pancreas transplants to be restarted. They were being done a uh, couple of, uh, I think, last decade back by Dr. Valeria. And hopefully we will have some uh, DCDs uh, to be started. We need to come out of this supplier versus needy uh, kind of a debate and we should be talking you know, on same page, uh, saving and gifting life uh, to the needy ones. And last but not the least, uh, this is what we are working upon and uh, uses of drone for the organ transfers. We do have a Sanjeevni project going on in Institute, which is in NCH Hajar. And uh, we are tying up with them and hopefully in next six to eight months, probably we'll have drones flying in and out of AIMS uh, for the organ transfer. Uh, I'll call upon Chavi to say the final word. This is uh, the team which is working at Trauma Center and each one is working relentlessly, I must tell you. I mean, one donor that you see, it's a hard work of at least two to three days sleepless nights by these team members who are sitting out here. Good afternoon. Um, sir, like me and Dr. Lalwani, we've been associated with uh, this program for the last maybe 18, 9 to 10 years. But it is mainly, I think, the mindset of the neurosurgeons, which has made a lot of difference. Early, it was very difficult to get a bed in ICU from shifting a brain dead patient or M1 from ED to ICU was a huge task. That's where it has made a major difference. One, and second is counseling or the breaking bad news, which uh, Dr. Radipak is doing himself. And these two are the main uh, things that have made a lot of difference. Although we had the system in place and we all have been working as a team for long. But uh, I think it would make it would further help us if uh, all the newer surgeons start helping and have the same mindset. And thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We'll be very, we'll be very happy to take up any questions. Uh, any... Dr. Kale, sir. Dr. Shino, yeah. Thank you.
Sir, for your kind encouraging words, Dr. Radhika, you would like to say.
All right. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.